Good afternoon. The Secretary General will start uh, with the pres presentation of uh, the meeting of uh, Defence Ministers and then uh, he'll be uh, here to take some of your questions. Secretary General. Good afternoon. Our thoughts remain with the Turkish people following last week's devastating earthquakes. Thousands of emergency response personnel from NATO allies have been supporting the relief efforts, including uh, with search and rescue teams, firefighters, medical personnel, and seismic experts. Moreover, uh, NATO allies and NATO has agreed to deploy shelter facilities to help accommodate uh, people displaced uh, by the earthquakes. We stand in strong solidarity with our ally, Turkey. NATO defense ministers will meet this week at an important moment for transatlantic security. We will take decisions to strengthen NATO's deterrence and defense. We will address our industrial capacity and increase the protection of our critical undersea infrastructure and we will step up and sustain our support for Ukraine. Almost one year since the invasion, President Putin is not preparing for peace. He is launching new offensives. So we must continue to provide Ukraine with what it needs to win and to achieve a just and sustainable peace. Ukraine's Defense Minister Alexei Resnikov will join us tomorrow both for the US-led contact group for Ukraine and for a meeting with NATO ministers. Together, we will address Ukraine's urgent needs. It is clear that we are in a race of logistics. Key capabilities like ammunition, fuel and spare parts must reach Ukraine before Russia can seize the initiative on the battlefield. Speed will save lives. If Putin wins in Ukraine, the message to him and other authoritarian regimes is that force is rewarded. That would make the world more dangerous and all of us more vulnerable. So I welcome the recent announcements by allies on new tanks, heavy weaponry and training uh, for Ukraine. And I look forward to further deliveries. Our message is clear. <clears throat> NATO stands with Ukraine for as long as it takes. Ministers will also address how to step up our practical support for Bosnia and Herzegovina, Georgia and Moldova. Three valued NATO partners which face Russian threats. On Wednesday, allies will take decisions to further strengthen our deterrence and defence. We have already done a lot, placing 40,000 troops under NATO command in the eastern part of the alliance, backed by major air and naval power, and doubling the number of battle groups from four to eight. Now we need to ensure we have the right forces and capabilities for the longer term. So I expect allies will agree new guidance for NATO defense planning. This will be a key driver of capability changes and ensure credible deterrence and defense in the years to come. Ministers will also focus on ways to increase our defense industrial capacity and replenish stockpiles. The war in Ukraine is consuming an enormous amount of ammunition and depleting Allied stockpiles. The current rate of Ukraine's ammunition expenditure is many times higher than our current rate of production. This puts our defense industries under strain. For example, the waiting time for large caliber ammunition has increased from 12 to 28 months. Orders placed today would only be delivered two and a half years later. So we need to ramp up production and invest in our production capacity. NATO has just completed an extraordinary survey of our munition stockpiles. 
And we plan to increase our targets for munition stockpiles through the NATO defense planning process. The good news is that several allies, including the United States and France, have already signed new multi-year contracts with the defense industry, enabling them to invest in increased production capacity. I look for, forward to for, further progress. This is essential to ensure we can keep supporting Ukraine while protecting, protecting every inch of allied territory. The protection of um, critical undersea infrastructure will also be high on our agenda. NATO has been working on this for many years, and we are now taking it into the next level. We have decided to establish a new coordination cell at uh, NATO headquarters to map our vulnerabilities and engage with industry. This will support our efforts to prevent and counter threats to critical infrastructure, including undersea cables and pipelines. And leaders at the Vilnius Summit will take further decisions to step up our efforts in this area. We will also work closely with the European Union through the NATO-EU Task Force on Resilience and Critical Infrastructure. NATO continues to adapt in all domains, including in space, which is becoming more crowded and competitive. This week, I expect allies will agree to establish a new virtual network of national um, and commercial satellites. This will improve our intelligence and surveillance and support NATO missions and operations. It will allow allies to increase the sharing of space-based data with a NATO command structure, facilitating better navigation, communication and early warning of missile launches. All of this work requires continued investment in our defense. So ministers will discuss ways to maintain and step up defense spending across the alliance. We are on the right track with eight consecutive years of increases by European allies and Canada. And an additional 350 billion extra spent so uh, far. I expect we will see further increases in defence spending this year, but we need to keep up the momentum. Our decisions this week will pave uh, the way for our summit in Vilnius in July and help keep our people safe in a more dangerous world. With that, I'm ready to take your questions. <clears throat> okay. We'll start with Agence France Presse. Uh, Secretary General, thank you very much. Mike Scalini, AFP. Uh, just two issues. You mentioned that Putin is starting new offensives in Ukraine. Do you believe that this is the beginning of the big uh, spring offensive that you've been warning about for a while? And then connected to the munitions, do you, how can you be so confident that uh, NATO will be able to keep up su supplies to Ukraine of the ammunition it needs to face a, a major offensive? And then a, a, another question on, on, on the balloons that we've seen. Have, uh, is NATO stepping up its own surveillance elsewhere around the, in Europe and other places of the balloons and the unidentified objects that we've seen in, over North America? Thanks. Um, first, uh, on uh, the ammunition. Well, uh, this is an issue we started to address uh, last year because we saw that the enormous amount of support for Ukraine, the only way to deliver that was to dig into our existing stocks. But of course, in the long run, we cannot continue to do that. We need to produce more to be able to deliver uh, sufficient ammunition to, uh, to Ukraine, but at the same time, ensure that we have uh, enough ammunition to protect and defend uh, all uh, NATO allies, uh, every inch of allied territory. Uh, so that, that's also the reason why we, uh, several months ago, started this um, extraordinary out-of-circle uh, review of our uh, stocks uh, and the need to um, increase our level uh, of, um, of, uh, of uh, stocks, meaning by, by increasing the guidelines for capability targets related to ammunition stocks, and also why allies um, have started to engage with the industry and several allies have already 
made decisions, agreed long-term contracts with the industry so they can ramp up production, make the investments to, to increase uh, investments. So I'm confident that we are now on the track or, or on, on the path that will enable us to both to continue to support Ukraine, but also to replenish our own stocks. Uh, and, and it just shows the importance of increased defense spending um, because uh, all of this, uh, of course, requires more defense expenditure uh, by uh, NATO allies. Um, then uh, on the balloons, well, <clears throat> I think what we saw over the United States, I visited the United States last week, is part of a pattern. Uh, where China, but also Russia, are increasing their intelligence and surveillance activities against NATO allies with many different platforms. We see it in cyber, and uh, we see it uh, with satellites, more and more satellites, and we see it then, uh, with uh, balloons. Uh, that highlights the importance of uh, our vigilance, uh, our increased uh, uh, presence, um, uh, and also that we ramp up and step up uh, how we share intelligence and how we uh, monitor and protect our airspace. Uh, and actually, one of the issues we're going to address and uh, uh, decide on the, on the ministerial meeting tomorrow is increased um, cooperation between allies in space, sharing more data, uh, collecting more uh, data also from commercial satellites, and then sharing that with the NATO command structure. So that's part of the overall picture how we do more uh, to monitor uh, and, uh, and uh, have sufficient surveillance capabilities to protect all our airspace. The first question was... Uh, do you believe that this is the start of the major Russian yeah. offensive that you've well, been warning well, about? Well, I think the reality is that we have seen the start already. Because we've seen what, what, what Russia does now, President Putin do now, is to send in thousands of thousands of more troops um, accepting a very high rate of casualty, um, taking uh, big losses, uh, but putting pressure on the Ukrainians. And what uh, Russia lacks in quality, they try to compensate in quantity, meaning that the leadership, the, the, the logistics, the equipment, the, 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 the training uh, don't have the same level uh, as the Ukrainian forces, but they have more forces. Uh, and the Russians are willing to send in those forces and, uh, and take a high, high number of casualties. So for me, this just highlights the importance of timing. It's urgent to provide Ukraine with more weapons. Uh, the faster we can deliver weapons, ammunition, spare parts, fuel uh, to the Ukrainian front, uh, the more lives we save and the... Uh, the uh, uh, um, the better we uh, support efforts to find a peaceful uh, negotiated solution to this uh, conflict. Okay. Uh, Reuters. Thank you. Secretary General, uh, as we are approaching the first anniversary of the invasion, um, what actions do you, Russia, expect to take uh, to mark that date um, on the battlefield in Ukraine and beyond? The most important message uh, is that we see no sign whatsoever that uh, President Putin is preparing for peace or ready to negotiate uh, something uh, which will respect uh, the territorial integrity and sovereignty of uh, Ukraine. Uh, uh, what we see is that President Putin and Russia uh, still wants to control Ukraine. Um, and therefore, uh, the only way to ensure that Ukraine prevails as a sovereign nation is to continue to provide uh, military support to Ukraine. And I welcome uh, what many allies or allies do uh, and have done for months, uh, stepping up uh, providing support to Ukraine. I will not speculate what uh, Russia will or President Putin will do on the 24th. Uh, but more importantly is that uh, we see how they are sending in more troops, more weapons, uh, more capabilities to try to pressure the Ukrainians. And we see also how the Ukrainians are able to resist and stand up against the Russian uh, aggression. The Deutsche Welle, NPR. 
Thank you. Max sort of took all the, quest the my top questions, but um, to follow up on, on a couple of things. Um, on the balloons, have, have other NATO countries started looking at whether, in fact, these balloons have been flown over other areas because they weren't necessarily detected in the beginning? So is this something that, uh, that you think uh, would, would require more, um, uh, sort of more research, and what kind of threat does it pose to NATO other than potential intelligence gathering? And also on ammunition, um, industry says um, that aside from a few large contracts, um, all of the work on, Im on increasing the speed of procurement has not actually resulted in a lot more contracts given to them at this point. So. If the, if, the, if, the, if the delay has been extended, even doubled in some cases, if you, don't, if you don't conclude a contract, even that period doesn't start. So what can you say about that? Thank you. So first of all, we are in close dialogue contact with the defense industry at the NATO level. Uh, I met with them and NATO allies uh, uh, have met and engaged with the defense uh, industry. And, uh, and there are several contacts which are, which are now signed. And you're absolutely right. What matters uh, at the end of the day is actually the signing of contracts, concrete commitments to buy more ammunition. Uh, and that has started to happen uh, in the United States, France, but also other allies. I don't know, for instance, Norway has signed big uh, contracts with their uh, ammunition uh, uh, industry to ramp up uh, production. Uh, of course, uh, in the short run, uh, uh, the industry can increase production by having more shifts, by, 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 by using existing production uh, uh, facilities uh, more. Uh, but to really have a significant increase, they need to invest and to build uh, new plants. And we see a combination, both of uh, utilizing existing uh, capacity more, and also by making uh, uh, decisions to invest in uh, in increased uh, capacity. This has started, but we need more, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we are um, uh, going to agree new guidelines for stockpiles, NATO guidelines, and also why we continue to engage uh, so closely with the defense industry to ensure that we get the increased uh, production of ammunition. On the balloons, well, I can just, also, as I said, or, um, also, last week I was in the United States. In August last year, I was actually in Canada, in the High North, as the first Secretary General ever to visit a NORAD facility up in the High North. And these are those radar facilities that monitor and track uh, all the airspace uh, uh, between Russia over the North Pole into uh, North America. And this is actually protecting uh, NATO. This is a vital capabilities for NATO. And uh, uh, NORAD, which is a, a, a joint... Uh, uh, also, capability that the that United States and Canada deliver together. Um, they have decided uh, to invest heavily in modernizing that with more advanced radars, uh, with uh, uh, better um, uh, uh, defense capabilities, and also visited uh, a Canadian air base uh, at Cold uh, Bay, uh, where, where they have the planes that actually intercept and, uh, and help to protect uh, Canadian and North American airspace. So, it just highlights the importance of that we are ramping up, uh, strengthening and improving our ability to defend airspace both over, over North America but also in Europe. And that's exactly what we have done over the last years with more air policing, with uh, better uh, space facilities and also that we will do at the Defence Ministerial meeting now where allies will come together and strengthen what they do in space to be able to better monitor, better detect any uh, violation of uh, NATO airspace. Ukraine phone. Yeah. Thank you for the floor. Dmitry Shkruko, National News Agency of Ukraine. We have seen uh, the reaction of Moldova and uh, Romania on the uh, missile incident uh, happened in the sky of Moldova and approaching to uh, Romanian borders. But any uh, way, you know, than uh, Russian missiles approaching to the NATO airspace, this is some kind of testing of the air defense of uh, NATO. Do you see that like some kind of uh, warning from the Russian side? And uh, another part of the question, do you see any threats to the supply routes, uh, NATO and NATO countries delivering uh, military support to Ukraine? Thank you. Wars are dangerous. Dangerous things happen every day. Uh, and, um, and of course, it's also, um, dangerous because incidents and accidents may happen. 
Uh, and that's exactly why we are so vigilant uh, in NATO um, to uh, prevent any escalation uh, beyond Ukraine. Um, and that's also why um, uh, we actually, before the invasion, during uh, last fall, uh, or the fall of 2021, um, uh, we increased our military presence uh, in the eastern part of the alliance, also in the Black Sea region. And also on the day of the invasion, uh, we met here in the NATO headquarters, we invoked NATO's defense plans, and we decided to further increase our military presence in the eastern part of the alliance with air, naval, and land uh, capabilities. We did that uh, partly to be able to uh, monitor, to protect, uh, to ensure uh, uh, no escalation beyond Ukraine, and also to be able to manage incidents or accidents uh, that may occur when there is a full-fledged war going on in our neighborhood in, uh, in Ukraine. But of course, this military presence of NATO troops, NATO forces, uh, uh, in Poland, in Romania, in Slovakia, in other countries, uh, in the Eastern part of the Alliance, also protects the space for NATO allies uh, to support Ukraine. Um, and that makes it even more important that we have increased our presence in the eastern part of the alliance. NATO is not party to the conflict, uh, but we support Ukraine. Uh, we support Ukraine in upholding the right for self-defense, and that is the right, the right which is enshrined in the UN Charter, and we have the right to support Ukraine. Frankfurt Allgemeine. <coughs> Thank you uh, very much. Thomas Kuczka, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Um, Secretary General, after President Zelensky's visit to Brussels last week, there's clearly uh, a reinvigorated debate now about building a coalition that could send uh, fighter airplanes to Ukraine. When this debate started almost a year ago, you were quite concerned and you said that NATO would not be sending airplanes because it would not be interfering into the war. So my question today is, do you still share these concerns um, that it might be seen uh, as an interference? And if not, um, how would a coalition, coalition have to be built? What would be the requirements uh, to make this really work? Thank you. So first, I think we need to distinguish between uh, two things. One uh, thing uh, is what was uh, discussed very much uh, last year, and that was uh, uh, the issue of uh, whether NATO should establish a no-fly zone over Ukraine and send in NATO planes uh, to uh, enforce no-fly zone. Uh, that's a very different thing uh, than what is discussed now, and that is the possibility of NATO allies uh, uh, deliver uh, 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 aircraft to Ukraine so they can use themselves. That's two very, very different things. Because if NATO was going to send NATO planes to enforce uh, with a NATO presence uh, in the airspace of Ukraine, a no-fly zone, that will be direct NATO involvement. Uh, it's a very different thing to provide the Ukrainians with different types of military capabilities um, uh, uh, that will not make us party to the conflict. Um, um, of course, the support Ukraine has evolved as the uh, war has evolved. In the beginning, there was an enormous uh, focus on javelins, on, on anti-tank, light anti-tank weapons. And then we saw the urgent need for uh, artillery, and allies started to step up uh, the delivery of also advanced modern artillery. Um, and then um, air defense has been uh, a main focus, and now heavy weaponry, um, um, uh, striker Bradleys, uh, infantry fighting vehicles, um, uh, martyrs from, uh, from, from Germany, uh, and then also main battle tanks. And there's a constant converse, uh, conversation, consultation process within the Alliance on what types of uh, weapon systems we should uh, deliver. And as you have seen from the media, there is now a, 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 a discussion going on also on the question of, uh, of uh, aircraft. And I expect that also to be uh, addressed uh, tomorrow at the meetings here in uh, Brussels. Uh, but let me add two things, and that is that one is speed, urgency, because whatever the opinion may be about aircraft, that will take time. What is needed now is urgent support for Ukraine. So my top priority is to ensure that the pledges allies have made for uh, uh, 
uh, infantry fighting vehicles, for uh, armor, for uh, uh, battle tanks, that they are delivered as soon as possible, because every day counts. The other thing uh, is that, yes, it is important to have a constant uh, uh, consultation among allies on what new uh, platforms we should uh, provide. And of course, this is evolving. Uh, but in addition to discussing new platforms, we need to be uh, extremely focused on ensuring that the platforms we have already delivered are working as they should. Just ensure that the air defense systems we have delivered, the, uh, the artillery we have delivered, has the ammunition, has the spare parts, has the maintenance, has the logistics, has all the sustainment they need to, to, to function, is an enormous logistical task that requires an enormous amount of, of, uh, of deliveries every day. So yes, of course, it is important to discuss new systems, but the most urgent need is to ensure that all the systems which are already there or are already been pledged are delivered and work as they should. NTV. Secretary General uh, Solomon from NTV Turkey. Of course, the issue is the earthquake in Turkey. After the devastating earthquake, Turkey requested the assistance of EADRCC, and EADRCC moved rather quickly. They have decided to deploy shelters in Turkey. So my question is, when these will be operational in Turkey? And apparently, the list of what Turkey needs is rather very long, because uh, it's really devastating. And to that end, what is the additional support you might be in a situation to, to, to send to Turkey. And there is also the, the, the question of the security, the raising security concerns from the southern flank between Syria and Turkey. And to that end, is there anything that NATO could do in order to deliver fully this uh, ash the tailored Ashad measures to Turkey? Tamti, thank you. Uh, as you said, uh, the Turkey asked for help uh, through our um, Euro-Atlantic disaster response uh, mechanism uh, very early. And, 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 and hours after the earthquake, we, we sent out a call to all allies and partners to provide support and help to Ukraine, uh, to, sorry, to Turkey after the earthquake. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's exactly what allies have done. Uh, bilaterally, uh, partly through NATO, and of course also through the European Union and, the, and in different ways. Uh, and I welcome all those efforts. Uh, that's, that's something which is extremely important. Uh, and uh, uh, NATO will deliver um, 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 shelters. Uh, we will do that as soon as possible. I'm not able to give you an exact uh, date, but, but, but allies and NATO are uh, working hard to deliver as much support as quickly as, as, uh, as possible. Uh, NATO has also provided some uh, transportation, and uh, I would think it's important both to make sure that we get uh, support quickly, uh, but also to ensure that we actually are able to stay, because this, will, uh, this earth earthquake will have consequences for a long time, and therefore uh, uh, Turkey uh, and the people that, uh, 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 in the region uh, will need support for a long time. Um, let me just reiterate my condolences, um, which I also have expressed directly to President Erdogan um, uh, for the loss of lives and the uh, uh, devastating consequences of the uh, earthquake uh, we have seen in, uh, in Turkey and, uh, and Syria. Associated Press. The Associated Press. Um, the, the war is coming up to a, virtually its one year mark, and, and I wonder if, uh, if you have any thoughts on, on how that's changed NATO and, in, in particular, your job. And, and, and is this a job that you want to keep doing uh, as we come into the, into the next summit in Vilnius? <coughs> in one way, it has not changed NATO. It has just demonstrated the importance of NATO uh, and how important uh, uh, it has been that uh, actually since 2014, NATO has uh, uh, implemented the biggest reinforcement of collective defense uh, in a generation. Uh, because the war didn't start in February last year, it started in 2014. And, uh, and that triggered a big adaptation of our alliance. Uh, with high readiness of forces, with uh, more presence in the eastern part of the uh, alliance, with more exercises, and also uh, for the first time in many, many years, all allies started to increase defense spending. 
So fundamentally, it hasn't changed NATO. Uh, it, it has only demonstrated the importance of allies standing together, um, both in providing support to Ukraine, but also in protecting each other, um, ensuring that the war doesn't escalate beyond uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, and, uh, and when we decided the morning of the invasion to increase our presence, then we were able to build on the increased presence we have already uh, implemented over the last years. We, we decided the battle groups in 2016, uh, and we actually increased uh, our presence also in the months ahead of the invasion because uh, the invasion was no surprise. Uh, this was an invasion we knew where it was coming, and therefore we were uh, prepared when it happened. Um, uh, yeah, for me, it is extremely uh, important to, to, to focus on my task as Secretary General in a demanding and challenging time for uh, the Alliance, and that's what I have to say about that. Uh, we'll go to ZDF. Thank you very much. Florian Neuhan from ZDF German TV. Mr. Stoltenberg, just a quick follow-up on the question with regard to fighter jets. Do I understand you correctly that you do not rule out those, uh, the delivery of fighter jets? Because there are some member states, especially uh, the German Chancellor, who said that this is no-go due to the risk of escalation. And a second question, I'm sure you're aware of the concept that your predecessor, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, has uh, developed uh, for Ukraine. Uh, he spoke of and he, he uh, promotes the idea of security guarantees for Ukraine in the midterm as an alternative to NATO membership. What do you think of this? Do you think this is realistic and a possibility to um, secure the future of Ukraine? Yes, it is important. Impo uh, sorry, yes, it is possible, of course, to secure the future of Ukraine. Uh, the first thing we need to do then is to help them to win this war. Uh, and that's exactly the main focus of everything we do, is to ensure sufficient uh, supplies uh, of everything from heavy uh, armor to, uh, uh, to, uh, to drones to, to fuel and non-military support in all forms and, uh, and shapes. Uh, so, so that's exactly what we do, so that's precondition number one. Um, the second uh, main uh, focus should be that when this war ends in one way or another, um, uh, we should ensure that Ukraine is able to deter and defend itself. Because uh, what we saw after 2014 is that uh, Ukraine was not in a position to deter a second attack. Russia went in and illegally annexed Crimea, and, and then a few weeks or months after, they went into eastern Donbass. And then we had the war going up and down for uh, many years until a full-fledged invasion. What we need now is that we are able to strengthen Ukraine uh, with uh, support, with training, and NATO also looks into the more long-term um, transformation of, uh, or transition of the Ukrainian armed forces from Soviet era doctrines and equipment, which is still a very important part of their armed forces, to modern NATO capabilities interoperable with NATO allies. So, so Ukraine can be in position to deter any further aggression. That's perhaps the most important thing uh, to secure uh, Ukraine in the future, and that is to enable them to have an even stronger armed forces uh, after some kind of uh, uh, peace arrangement uh, 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 that may be uh, agreed uh, at the end of the war uh, in, uh, in Ukraine to prevent a third big attack uh, on uh, Ukraine after 2014, after what happened last year, and then, and then uh, a potential new one. So that's the second thing, uh, is to ensure that uh, we work with Ukraine on long-term uh, re reforms, long-term uh, interoperability, long-term uh, transition to NATO standards, and, uh, and uh, help them to build up their armed forces even more. Uh, and, then, and then the third issue will be the issue of whether there will be some international arrangements, agreements, uh, assurances. Well, that may be uh, part of uh, uh, some kind of negotiated solution where our allies also participate. I'm careful speculating exactly how they will be formulated and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and what kind of framework they will be uh, 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 issued. But I'm saying that, of course, some kind of arrangements uh, where uh, NATO allies uh, provide also some assurances in different ways to Ukraine, absolutely uh, possible that will be part of an overall solution to the conflict in, uh, in Ukraine to 
to, to maximize the likelihood of Ukraine being able to deter any further attacks or uh, a new Russian attacks against their country. Financial Times. Sorry. <laughs> the, the fact that, well, well as I, I have nothing more to say that what we have seen over one year, uh, close to one, one year of this war, is that what type of support we provide evolves. And there is a discussion, as there's been discussions about every step. We had a discussion about Patriots, we had a discussion about uh, armor, we had a discussion about battle tanks, we had a discussion of long-range uh, 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 HIMARS. Uh, uh, and, 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 and this is an important discussion. Uh, the important thing is that NATO is not a part of the conflict, even though NATO allies uh, provide advanced weapon systems to Ukraine. Uh, 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 we have the right to provide support for them because Ukraine defend themselves against the war of aggression. Uh, and then, regardless of uh, what you think about aircraft, that will take time. So we need to now at least ensure that we deliver what we can deliver in the short term, because that can really make a difference on the battlefield in the coming weeks and months. Financial Times. Thank you so much. Sorry to be a pain. Um, uh, I wanted to ask about the ammunition. Um, from what you've said, it doesn't sound like this is a solvable problem if they are using it faster than we can build it. Uh, delivery times are, are doubling, uh, as you've just said, and we can't just invent new factories. Uh, how do we solve that then? Or is, are we at a point now where Ukraine is at a ceiling of what can be provided month by month by NATO allies and non-NATO allies in, in, the, in the larger coalition of Rammstein. Um, are we at that point already now, where Ukraine has a limit of what it can use every month? Thank you. So what I said uh, was that the current rate of uh, ammunition consumption is uh, higher, bigger than the current rate of production. That's a factual thing. Uh, but since we have been aware of that for some time, we have started to do something. We're not just sitting there idle and watching this happening. So that's the reason why we, over several months, have uh, worked hard at NATO uh, and also within the, the Rammstein format to ramp up production. That's the reason why we launched this uh, out of circle extraordinary review of our stockpiles, uh, why we have collected the data, and now we are using this data to go to individual allies and, uh, and work with them to, to, to sign contracts with, uh, with the industry. And that's exactly what they do. Uh, and, of course, the industry has the capability to increase the production also short-term. Sometimes there is some, some, some uh, uh, non-used or not utilized uh, 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 capability there. But even when you have a factory running, you can have more shifts. Uh, you can even work during weekends. Uh, this is an uh, issue of cost and price. And then you need, of course, to invest in new uh, 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 also def, um, in, in production uh, um, capability. And that's also what they do, um, uh, especially when the uh, defense industry can have uh, multi-year contracts. And we have seen, seen several examples of allies now signing multi-year contracts, uh, and then the industry have the demand signal they need to make the investments. So yes, we have a challenge, yes, we have a problem, uh, but problems are there to be solved and we are addressing that problem, and we have strategies uh, to solve it both in the short and also longer term uh, to as a mobilize the defense industry. And if there is anything NATO allies and our economists and our societies have uh, proved over decades, is that we are dynamic, we are adaptable, we can change when needed. So if you just send a clear signal and also mobilize the financial resources, as we are doing with our pledge to invest more, and then the industry have proven extremely capable of producing uh, more. Uh, and let me also add, that of course, this is the, the challenge of having enough ammunition is also a big challenge for, uh, for uh, uh, Russia. Uh, so uh, it just shows that this is a war of attrition, and the war of attrition becomes a battle of logistics, and uh, we focus on the logistical part of the defense capacity, defense uh, industry capacity, uh, to ramp up production. Well set. Here in the front, second row. Uh, my name is Sergei Peles. I'm from Belsat TV. Uh, Secretary General, uh, most of Belarusian nation does not support the Russia's aggression against Ukraine. 
which is why Lukashenko regime did not decide to openly participate in the aggression, but only supports it. What is the NATO's position on this, on this uh, complicity of the Lukashenko regime? Does NATO separate the political regime from Belarusian society? Yes, also we are aware of that uh, Belarus is not a democracy. We are aware that, that, uh, that the regime um, uh, in, in, in Minsk doesn't represent the people of, of Belarus. Uh, uh, because we have also seen how uh, the elections were totally manipulated and the, and the election results were not uh, respected. So, so we are aware that, that, that the people of Belarus they have a very different uh, opinion about the war. Uh, than the uh, regime. And of course, the regime is complicit in uh, Russia's illegal war, uh, because even though uh, uh, Belarus has not sent in their own troops, they have allowed uh, President Putin and Russia to use Belarus uh, as a platform to launch uh, attacks against, uh, against Ukraine. We, you can remember at the beginning of the war, that uh, the day the invasion started, actually many of the forces came in from the north, from Belarus, trying to take Kiev and, uh, and uh, territory in the, in the north. Uh, Belarusian territory it continues to be used uh, for air and missile attacks. Um, and also the joint exercises, of course, is a challenge uh, for the Ukrainians, as the, the uh, exercises between Belarus and, uh, and the Belarusian and Russian forces. So, so, so the, 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 the Belarusian regime should not be complicit, should, 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 should not support uh, Russia's illegal uh, war efforts. This is a blatant violation of international law and, uh, and something that uh, also Belarus should, uh, of course, condemn. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I, I understand that the, uh, the, uh, the support of fighter aircrafts to Ukraine, that's not the highest priority, but the discussion is ongoing. The Brits are, will start training pilots and there are countries that's not ruling it out. So, Mr. Secretary General, will you speak in favor of it or will you warn against it? And my second question is about uh, uh, the, the NATO websites that were taken down over the weekend. Has NATO been a uh, target of a cyber attack over the weekend? Or can you give a status on that? Thank you. The cyberspace is uh, contested um, in all times, and uh, we face at NATO malicious cyber activities uh, on a daily basis, and we are strengthening our cyber defenses. Uh, so this is something we have responded to over uh, many years, because we have seen more and more uh, uh, different types of cyber attacks, uh, uh, malicious cyber activities against uh, our uh, networks, uh, and. Uh, we have seen some attempted denial of service incidents against uh, a number of NATO websites uh, on, um, uh, since Sunday. Uh, additional protective um, uh, measures have been put in place and the majority of NATO websites are uh, functioning now as uh, normal. Uh, some NATO websites are still experiencing availability uh, 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 issues, uh, but our technical teams are uh, now working to restore uh, full uh, access. Then it is extremely important to understand the following. Our classified networks, the networks we use to communicate between NATO uh, missions and operations and NATO, within the NATO command structure, uh, were not affected and there is currently no evidence of impact on NATO operations. So one thing is our, as I say, public uh, um, 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 pages or, or, or uh, sites where we actually share information with the, uh, with the world outside the NATO, uh, there have been attempts uh, uh, to have denial of services, uh, 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 so activities against those uh, uh, pages, but uh, NATO's classified network has not been attacked. Okay. Final question, answer. Okay, thank you for the floor. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, <clears throat> the words of former Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi have caused an earthquake in Italy. He said that he would not go to Zelensky if he were Prime Minister now because he attacked the independent republics of the Donbass and that Biden should force him to a truce. And in Italy, some commentators see these statements as pure Kremlin propaganda. 
and the problem is that Berlusconi party is part of the governing, uh, governing coalition. So are you afraid that Italy could be, or could be seen as the coalition soft on their belly? And are you satisfied with the military aid provided to Kiev, or could Rome do more? First of all, I met with uh, Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni just after she uh, took office uh, some months ago, and uh, the message from her was very clear. I also met with the Foreign Minister, the Defence Minister, the Defence Minister of Italy will be here tomorrow, uh, and, and, and the message from the Italian government is absolute support uh, to Ukraine uh, for the NATO efforts to provide uh, su uh, support to Ukraine, so all NATO allies, including Italy, of course, agree. Uh, and, uh, and continue to provide uh, support. Uh, and uh, Italy has provided uh, significant support. We welcome, of course, more support uh, from all allies, including Italy. Uh, and uh, I also welcome the fact that Italy and France are now working together to deliver the advanced air defense system, SAMT, which is an Italian-French uh, joint uh, effort. So, so I'm, abs I'm absolutely confident that Italy will remain a strong supporter of NATO's uh, strong support to Ukraine. Uh, not least because Italy understands, as all other allies uh, understand, that this is about our security. It, is, it will be a tragedy for Ukrainians if President Putin wins, but it will also be dangerous for us. It will make us more vulnerable because the message to him would then be that when he uses military force, violates the international law, he gets what he wants. Thank you very much. This concludes this press conference. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.